This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Hello, I'm Mark Carney. And in my BBC Wreath Lectures, I'm going to chart how we've come to esteem financial value over human values and how we've been moving from market economies to market societies. I'll argue that this has contributed to a series of global crises of credit, COVID, and climate. And I'll outline how we can turn this around. In my second lecture, I'm going to look back at the dramatic events of 2008, the crash when the world stared into a financial abyss. What lessons have we really learnt? Welcome to the second of the 2020 BBC Wreath Lectures with the former Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Now, his series focuses on the way financial values have come to dominate human values and where that leaves us and what we might do about it. Today, Mark Carney is going to take us back to the near total implosion of the banking system in the autumn of 2008. He's going to argue that a deeper crisis in our values underpinned that unforgettable lurch towards the abyss. And more than a decade on, he's going to examine how we can prevent another financial meltdown. This second lecture is called From Credit Crisis to Resilience. Please give a very warm welcome to the BBC's 2020 Wreath Lecturer, Dr Mark Carney. It's hard now to remember how different things were in August 2007. The new world order promoted by the United States had delivered seemingly effortless prosperity. The Washington consensus, centered on free markets, free trade, and open capital markets, reigned supreme. The United Kingdom was in its 14th year of uninterrupted growth, and central banks were congratulating themselves on delivering the great moderation. In the financial sector, Bankers saw themselves as masters of the universe. Risk was thought to have been spread evenly across the globe through the miracle of subprime securitization. Light touch regulation protected trusting if somewhat envious citizens. And then, a couple of obscure European synthetic credit funds stopped dancing to the music, and though few recognized it at the time, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression had begun. Jean-Claude Trichet, then president of the European Central Bank, was fond of telling a story of his fellow central banker, who was then taking a long scheduled walking holiday in Scotland. With his Blackberry having run dry and anxious for the news, this central banker went into a local shop and asked the woman behind the counter, do you have the Financial Times? Yes, sir, came the reply. Would you like yesterday's or today's? Well, Madam, I'd very much prefer today's. We'll then come back tomorrow. But Trichet's colleague couldn't wait. He had to go straight back to Frankfurt to join an unprecedented initiative by the European Central Bank to pump billions and billions of euros of liquidity into their money markets. Because he knew that a quick tug on the loose threads that started to appear that August didn't just unravel a sweater, but a whole wardrobe. And not just any wardrobe, but a walk-in closet, positively Kardashian in its expanse. Within a year, a series of storied institutions from Northern Rock to Lehman Brothers had failed or been rescued by the state, and the world economy was in freefall. The future arrived with a bang. From great moderation to great recession, from boom to bust, from confidence to mistrust. And the consequences were severe. A lost decade. Real household incomes in the United Kingdom did not grow at all over the following 10 years. The worst performance since Karl Marx was scribbling the Communist Manifesto in the British Library. There was growing fragmentation of the global economy. The third wave of globalization crested with that financial crisis. And since then, growth in trade and capital flows have slowed sharply and the multilateral trading system has been unwinding. And there's been growing mistrust of experts. A financial system 
lauded by most economists and policymakers as well as all bankers, came crashing down on the heads of ordinary people, some of whom are still suffering the consequences. And they, like Her Majesty the Queen, wondered, why did no one notice it? The fault lines these experts missed would have been familiar to students of financial history. Too much debt, excessive reliance on markets for liquidity, Byzantine complexity, regulatory arbitrage, and misaligned incentives. Most economists, financiers, and policymakers missed these growing vulnerabilities because they were involved in the great project of completing the financial market universe with the precision of physicists. You see, economists, myself included, generally suffer from physics envy. We covet its neat equations and crave its deterministic systems. And this inevitably leads to disappointment. The economy isn't deterministic. People aren't always rational. Human creativity, frailty, exuberance, and pessimism all contribute to economic and financial cycles. As a great physicist, Sir Isaac Newton lamented, I can calculate the motions of celestial bodies, but not the madness of people. Newton's exasperation came after he'd lost a fortune investing in the South Sea Company, or more precisely, after he had speculated on one of the greatest financial bubbles ever. Newton would have benefited from something I learned early on in my career in finance from a gentleman named Bob Hurst, who was then one of the partners at Goldman Sachs. Bob's rule was, if something doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Beneath this sort of Popeye-esque tautology was real wisdom. His point was that if someone explains something to you in finance, such as a flashy new product or why a company's valuation should be orders of magnitude higher than others in their sector, and it doesn't make sense, ask the person to repeat the rationale. And if that response still doesn't make sense, you should run. Newton didn't run. An inertia all too common throughout history. Because something that starts as fundamentally innovative ends up being pushed to ridiculous extremes. Belief turns to madness, momentum is everywhere, value loses touch with fundamentals, and everything becomes relative. And so it was in the run-up to the global financial crisis. The new era thinking in the first decade of the millennium was grounded in very real boost to prosperity from global integration and technological innovation. Now that initial success bred complacency. And the infrastructure of markets didn't keep up with innovation. Increases in the buffers of banks lagged behind the explosive growth in their balance sheets. Few masters of the universe focused on the longer-term consequences of their actions. Market failures and human frailties were ignored. Moral sentiments turned into market sentiments. This was not merely a technical failure. This was a crisis of values as well as value. The pre-crisis era was an age of disembodied finance, where markets grew far apart from the households and businesses they ultimately served. See, in most professions, people see the real impact of their work. Teachers witness the growth of their students, farmers, that of their crops. When bankers become disconnected from their ultimate clients in the real economy, they have no direct view of their impact. Before this crisis, traders began to see the numbers on their screen as a game to be won, ignoring the consequences of their actions on hundreds of millions of mortgage holders and company borrowers. Value was relative, and values suffered. Markets built on markets were not just financially, but ethically fragile. See, financial history rhymes all too frequently with enormous costs. 800 years of economic history teaches that financial crises occur roughly once a decade. In finance, institutional memories are short. Lessons that are painfully learned during busts are gradually forgotten as new eras dawn and the cycle begins anew. And this is a depressing cycle of prudence, confidence, complacency, euphoria, and despair. And it's a cycle which reflects the power of the three lies of finance.
The first lie is the four most expensive words in the English language. This time is different. This misconception is usually the product of an initial success, with early progress gradually building into blind faith in a new era of effortless prosperity. Several factors drove the debt supercycle in the run-up to the financial crisis, including demographics and the stagnation of middle-class real wages, that itself a product of technology and globalization. Households had to borrow to increase consumption. Let them eat cake became let them eat credit. Financial innovation made that easier, and the ready supply of foreign capital made it cheaper. Most importantly, and this is the lie, complacency amongst individuals and institutions, complacency fed by a long period of macroeconomic stability and rising asset prices, made this remorseless borrowing seem sensible. A deep-seated faith in markets lay behind the new era thinking of the great moderation. Captured by the myth that finance can regulate and correct itself spontaneously, authorities retreated from their regulatory and supervisory responsibilities. This leads to the second lie, the belief that the market is always right. This has two dangerous consequences. First, if markets are efficient, we can identify bubbles or address their potential causes. Second, if markets are always clear, they should possess a natural stability. And evidence to the contrary must be the product either of market distortions or incomplete markets. And such thinking dominated the practical indifference of policymakers to the housing and credit booms before the crisis. Much of financial innovation springs from the logic that the solution to market failures is to build new markets on old ones, an attempt at progress through infinite regress. During the Great Moderation, this view became an organizing principle for financiers and policymakers. And the latter pursued a light-touch regulatory agenda in the quest for a perfect real world of complete markets, first described as abstract theory by two economists, Arrow and Dubreu. And this is a world of rational agents, coolly calculating odds over all future possible states of the world, trading contracts with each other that are frictionlessly enforced and achieving mutually beneficial, indeed socially optimal, outcomes. Of course, markets only clear in textbooks. In reality, as Newton learned at his cost, People are irrational, and economies are imperfect. And when such imperfections exist, adding markets can make things worse. A truth of finance is that the riskiness of an asset depends on who owns it. When markets don't clear, financial institutions may be surprised to find out what they own and for how long. And when those surprises are or are thought to be widespread, panic ensues. The impossibility of completing markets was not the only practical problem with the pre-crisis approach. Even if markets could be perfected, nature itself is unknowable. Newtonian mechanics break down at the subatomic level, and the search for the grand unifying theory of everything that matters persists in physics to this day. Market fundamentalism relies on people being able to calculate the odds of each and every possible scenario, they can trade contracts and insure with each other against risks that they're unwilling to bear. But a moment of introspection reveals the absurdity of these assumptions compared to the real world. More often than not, even describing the universe of possible outcomes is beyond the means of mere mortals, let alone ascribing subjective probabilities to each outcome. The swings in sentiment that result, pessimism one moment, exuberance the next, reflect not only nature's odds, but also our assessments of those odds, assessments that are inevitably distorted by human behavior. A successful speculator himself, John Maynard Keynes, argued that people price assets based not on their estimates of fundamental value, but rather on what they think those values are, or rather what everybody else would predict the average of those assessments would be. It is the derivative of the derivative of subjective utility, the CDO squared of utility. These dynamics can afflict not just sophisticated investors, but mortgage lenders and home buyers, especially during a new era.
If house prices can only go up, it's possible to borrow at large multiples and pay off future obligations with the capital gains that follow. The third lie, that markets are moral, takes for granted the social capital that markets need to fulfill their promise. In financial markets, means and ends can be conflated all too easily. Value can become abstract and relative, and the pull of the crowd can overwhelm the integrity of the individual. Repeated episodes of misconduct in the run-up to the global financial crisis called into question the social license that markets need to innovate and grow. Financial market participants were found to have knowingly missold to clients products that were inappropriate or even fraudulent. Traders manipulated key interest rates and foreign exchange benchmarks to support their trading positions while costing retail and corporate clients who relied on those benchmarks billions of pounds. If you read the transcripts of the chat room discussions that orchestrated these outrages, what's striking is how completely detached the traders were from the businesses and households whom they were cheating. So rather than being professional and open, some critical markets, such as those for bonds, currencies, and derivatives, became informal and clubby. Rather than competing on merit, participants colluded online. Rather than everyone taking responsibility for their actions, few were held to account. The global financial crisis reminded us that real markets don't just happen. They depend on the quality of market infrastructure. That means both hard infrastructure, in other words, the structure of the markets themselves, such as the design of financial market benchmarks, and it means soft infrastructure, like regulations, codes, and culture that govern behavior in those markets. It's critical to get this infrastructure right because financial markets serve us all. By financing firms to hire, invest, and expand, markets help drive growth and create jobs. By opening up international trade and investment, markets create new opportunities for our businesses and savers. And by transferring risks to those most willing and able to bear them, markets help households and businesses insure against the unexpected. And markets have become ever more important to people as they bear increasing responsibility for financing their retirements and insuring against risks. So it's obviously vital that markets work well and that they are seen to do so. So this time is no different. Markets don't always clear, and we can suffer from their amorality. And the question is what to do with such knowledge, and how can we retain it so that financial history stops rhyming? I think the answer starts with the radical program of G20 reforms that are working to create a safer, simpler, and fairer financial system. A financial system that can better serve households and businesses in bad times as well as good, a system that can help support greater inclusion and the transition to a net zero carbon economy. These pro-market reforms are vital, but they are not sufficient in and of themselves. Regulation alone won't break an eight century cycle of financial boom and bust. To resist the siren calls of the three lies, policymakers and market participants must bind themselves to the mass. And that ultimately means recognizing the limits of markets and rediscovering our responsibilities for the system. If the experience of the financial and COVID crises teaches us anything, it's humility. We cannot anticipate every risk or plan for every contingency, but we can and must plan for failure. That means creating an anti-fragile system, a system that can withstand both the risks we see and those we don't. An anti-fragile system requires banks that can stand on their own, which is why banks are now required to hold 10 times as much capital as they did before the crisis. An anti-fragile system requires ending too big to fail because perhaps the most severe blow to public trust was the revelation that scores of banks operated in a heads-I-win-tails-you-lose bubble. Those banks privatized profits in the run-up to the crisis before socializing the losses when the music stopped at a total cost of $15 trillion in public support. That unjust sharing of risk and reward contributed directly to inequality, but almost as importantly has had a corrosive effect on the broader social fabric on which finance relies. Now, G20 standards are bringing back market discipline 
by ensuring that globally systemic banks, so the largest banks in the world, ensuring that they can fail safely in the future. Over time, this can help rebuild social capital and increase economic dynamism. An anti-fragile system must also be as robust to operational failures as to financial ones. In our digital era, systemic shocks can come from non-financial sources such as cyber attacks. And so to improve firms' defenses, the UK's largest banks are now subject to what are called cyber penetration tests. And they also have to plan for failure by creating plans to restore quickly their vital services in case a cyber attack gets through. And finally, an anti-fragile system requires a comprehensive macroprudential framework. What does that mean? That means encouraging authorities to meet the next challenge, not simply fight the last war. They must explore what could happen rather than seek the false comfort of being ready for what's most likely to happen. We need to remember that risks are the greatest when they seem that they're the least. The cost of interventions are felt today, but their benefits are realized far into the future. And even then, it's difficult to prove. Counterfactuals are hard to sell. It could have been worse doesn't quite have the ring of you've never had it so good. So over time, and particularly during good times, these challenges feed a bias towards inaction. When it comes to financial stability, success, not failure, is an orphan. To re-establish the social license of finance requires a combination of regulation and true cultural change. In the long history of scandal, response, integrity, drift, and then new scandal, the potential solutions have oscillated between the extremes of light-touch regulation and total regulation. And there are problems with each of these. Light-touch regulation led directly to the financial crisis, as I've outlined. Market standards were poorly understood, often ignored, almost always lacked teeth. Too many participants neither felt responsible for the system nor recognized the full impact of their actions. Bad behavior went unchecked and proliferated and eventually became the norm. On the other hand, a system reliant on total regulation and punishment after the fact is similarly bound to fail because it promotes a culture of complying with the letter of the law, not its spirit, and because authorities will inevitably lag behind developments in fast-changing markets. A more comprehensive and lasting solution combines public regulation with private standards to restore the accountability of individuals for their own actions and for the system. And there are three components of this. Aligning pay with values, increasing senior management accountability, and thirdly, renewing a sense of vocation in finance. A lesson of the crisis was that pay schemes that delivered large bonuses for short-term returns encourage bankers to take on the wrong kinds of risks. There's a world where the present counted for almost everything and the future, nothing. So to better align incentives with the long-term interests of their firm and society, financial institutions in the United Kingdom now must defer a significant proportion of pay for up to seven years. Employees won't get these delayed bonuses if evidence emerges in the future of misconduct or failures of risk management or unexpectedly poor financial performance. These measures reinforce the responsibilities of individuals for the longer-term consequences of their actions, and they make them more accountable. They also establish clearly the responsibilities of senior managers for training their employees and overseeing their performance, creating the right sense of solidarity within their organizations. Now, in parallel, many banks have rightly develop codes of ethics or business principles, but given their generality, it's fair to wonder whether all their traders will absorb their meaning. And if it's not realistic for traders to apply Aristotelian principles to fast-moving markets, a complementary approach is to rely on traders' intuitive understanding of what constitutes a true market. So in order to guide that understanding, Authorities have developed principles of fair and effective markets, and the private sector has designed new codes and standards to bring those principles to life. Now, as I said a moment ago, codes are of little use if nobody reads them, follows them, or enforces them. And this is where the senior manager's regime comes in. It gives teeth to voluntary codes 
by having firms embed them and by re-establishing the link between seniority and accountability. Ultimately, though, social capital is not contractual. Integrity can neither be bought nor regulated. It must come from within, and it must be grounded in values. All market participants should recognize that market integrity is essential to fair financial capitalism. To build a sense of responsibility for the system as a whole, business ultimately needs to be seen as a vocation, an activity with high ethical standards, which in turn conveys certain responsibilities. Having a sense of vocation begins by asking the right question. Whom does finance serve? Itself, the real economy, society? And to whom is the financier responsible? Herself, his business, their system? The answers start from recognizing that financial capitalism is not an end in itself, but a means to promote investment, innovation, growth, and prosperity. Banking is fundamentally about intermediation, connecting borrowers and savers in the real economy. And the foundation of this approach are boards and CEOs, defining clearly the purpose of their organizations and promoting a culture of ethical business throughout them. It also means employees being grounded in strong connections to their clients and their communities. And it means bankers seeing themselves as custodians of their institutions, improving them before passing them along to their successors. The G20 reforms since the crisis are creating a stronger, simpler, and fairer financial system. And with time and continued service, it can regain people's confidence. But as I said, the challenge will be that when it comes to financial stability, memories fade, complacency sets in, and pressure to compromise reemerges. So we must be vigilant, resist the three lies of finance, and reinforce some core financial truths because the next time won't be different. Authorities and market participants must therefore try to anticipate new risks from cyber to crypto while building an anti-fragile system that can withstand those risks that we don't anticipate. Because markets aren't always right and can overshoot in both directions, central banks need to adapt their roles as lenders, not buyers of last resort. And because markets aren't inherently moral, they can distort value and corrode values if they are left unattended. We need to promote the values of responsibility, solidarity, integrity, and prudence as best we can through pay, through codes and regulations, while recognizing that these can only be fully lived through culture and practice. So while authorities must continue to put in place the infrastructure to make markets work, there is no simple unifying formula to break the destructive cycle of financial history. Physics won't save finance. Promoting a system in which all its participants live society's core values will. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, do come and join us. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Right. Um, let's open this up now for our audience. But first, if I may start, um, you, you talk about the G20 reforms. You mm. talk about uh, taming traders and trying to teach them to be decent human beings. You talk about tempering that pendulum swing, the mood swing of the market. But isn't that just tinkering around the edges. I disagree with that. I think at the core, these markets are central to our prosperity. It opens up new opportunities for our companies and therefore jobs and growth. The challenge with them are, the financial markets, is they move to extremes, and it's in those extremes that great risks lie. And I, we have to recognize that that pendulum is there, as, uh, to use your analogy, and that they will move to those extremes. Um, so the markets have to be resilient, not break when they move to those extremes. Those in the markets should not be brought in to feed on those extremes uh, in terms of, quite frankly, corruption of, uh, of their behavior, which one has seen in the past. And that's what those reforms are bringing in. But at its core, what we want is those markets so that our companies can access uh, capital so they can invest and grow jobs. Uh, you can get a mortgage. You, I can get a mortgage for a house. 
and uh, our friends can uh, insure against risks that they face. There were parts of your lecture, and I, I wanted to wrap them around myself like a, like a comfort blanket, you know, talking about anti-fragility, that yes. we have to make a system that is, that is not fragile. But how can you possibly do that? When you have situations which are like meteor strikes, yeah. so, you know, the, um, the subprime mortgage, no-one saw that coming. Some people did see it coming. But those who were in authority uh, tried to convince themselves that it was unlikely to happen as opposed to asking the question, what happens if it happens? So in other words, what if house prices go down by a great deal in the U.S.? The, I, I remember I was part of these meetings in the run-up to it, and the view of most U.S. authorities was, well, house prices never go down nationwide in the U.S., so it won't happen, therefore we don't have to worry about it. Well, instead of asking the question, which is to flip it around and say, assume the bad thing, make sure the system is there. Eisenhower had a phrase, which is that plans are useless, planning is essential. Okay? He was a pretty successful general, he was a successful president. So a lot of what the authorities now do is do planning for bad things happening and think about what the system needs to have in order to withstand it. Now, what actually happens is, to use your language, comes from a different direction. Mm. We just saw that with COVID. You know, we didn't plan for that exact scenario. However... We were planning for some pretty difficult shocks that could have happened to the UK financial system. And partly as a consequence of that, the plan was useless for, because the shock didn't come, but the planning was essential and has been put in place mm. and has meant that the system has been there. What is brilliant about having you doing these lectures is that you are the man in the room where it happened. We also have others who yes, are in the room where so. it happened. Uh, and I'd like to turn to Alistair Darling, who is with us, and Chancellor of the Exchequer during the crash. Do you sometimes wake up in a cold sweat thinking, my God, I was in the middle of all of that? Well, I do remember it, and I remember just about everything that um, Mark was talking about because we work very closely together. And Mark's dead right that the problem will arise when a new generation comes along, when the last person who was around 10 years ago disappears and the collective memory is lost. That's when the risks start to arise again. How close were we, Mr Darling, to a total collapse of the system? Well, we were actually about three hours away from it. Um, I vividly remember the call I got from the then chairman of RBS, then the biggest bank in the world. In size, it was bigger than the UK economy. And there was a massive run on the bank at the beginning of October of 2008. He rang me up and said they were hemorrhaging funds. And what was I going to do about it? And, you know, we had a plan. We were ready to go. And I said, how long can you last? And he said, well, we're going to run out of money this afternoon. And you think about it, if the bank had gone down cash machines had gone off, people couldn't get their cash, Northern Rock would have looked like a quiet, sunny afternoon. It would have been absolutely disastrous, not just for the UK, but for the system right across the world. That's how close we came for all the reasons that Mark has uh, set out. Good to bring you in the room together. And I know, Mr Darling, you have a question for Mark Harney. Yeah, Mark, you'll remember that uh, 10 years ago, crucial to our efforts to stop the banking system from a total collapse and crucially rebuilding the economy afterwards was international cooperation. You'll remember we sat around the table with Republican-led America, communist-led China, ourselves, countries right across the world. And if it hadn't been for that international cooperation, frankly, I doubt if it would have succeeded. Looking at the world today, which is far more nationalistic far more protectionist. I'm just wondering how you see it, because it seems to me, whether it's a financial crisis, the pandemic, climate change, if you don't get international cooperation and a recognition that we live in one world, uh, then we're going to struggle. Uh, it's absolutely right. I mean, and I should underscore the leadership uh, that Alistair showed uh, throughout these uh, difficult times, including in this crucial meeting, uh, which was in the cash room, this glorious room of the U.S. Treasury, probably the darkest meeting they've had in that room ever. And uh, the fact is, by that point, having been through RBS and others, the U.K. came with a comprehensive plan, which in effect changed some of the words. And I think they used uh, American spelling uh, instead of U.K. spelling, but effectively became the G7 plan and was applied across the G7 and spread through the G20. And that's what arrested the decline. Now, that was possible partly because of relationships, partly because of an understanding of just how intertwined the system was. And I think there's much less of an understanding or appreciation of that now. And it makes it that much more difficult to harness those resources if we were to face something as similar. And it also difficult means... Difficult or impossible. Uh, I mean. Well, I wouldn't say necessarily impossible. I think the next several years 
will be um, very informative about how the system evolves. If there's no prospect of international cooperation, then you have to put big walls up around your domestic financial system. And that actually comes at quite a cost because you have to protect yourself. I'm not sure you can fully protect yourself so you have a sort of false sense of sovereignty and independence. The medium ground could well be that with like-minded economies, there is a greater degree of openness, and this could be true for technology, it could be true for climate, and it could be true for finance. It may be tricky, but we can still squeak through. I mean, I think, I think that's what you're saying. I it's think going there's, to be, a, there's, a, there's a possibility, there's a possi- but we have to recognise yeah. the mm. risk. Thank you very much indeed. The, the underlying backdrop of this is and who knows what, what will happen in the future, but it's the, it's the relationship, the importance of the relationship with America. Let's cross over to somebody who knows America very, very well. From Chicago, Deirdre McCluskey is with us, Professor of Economics, History and English at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Welcome to you, <coughs> Professor. Well, what's essential to all this is the vocation of the banker. The great German sociologist Max Weber spoke about politics as a vocation and science as a vocation, by which he meant exactly what I think Mark means, an internal ethical control over one's behavior. But I'm not so optimistic as Mark is that if... Financial arrangements are creative and uncertain and involve occasional black swans, such as COVID, then we're in a position to engineer a smoothness to the financial world. I just don't think that's any more plausible than it is in science or the arts. Will we have booms and busts? Clearly, we'll continue to have these cycles. The question is whether we can build enough resiliency and diversity in the system. Let's get a very quick response uh, from Deirdre. If it were easy to smooth things, you and I could make an unlimited fortune. There's an American proverb that applies, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? (laughs) You don't get rich in public service, Deirdre. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't want it. Well, well, some do, but that's not in our... uh, yeah. Our world. Yeah. Oh, that is interesting. Actually, I was talk- talking to somebody who knows you rather well, who said uh, it is very strange about Mark Carney as a man who has been such a powerful banker. He has very little interest in money. And that seems to be what you've just, <laughs> you've just said yourself. Uh, let's take another question now from um, one of our audience members, Jennifer O'Neill. What does Mr Carney think about the volume of corporate and sovereign debt issuance uh, in the wake of the current interest rate environment? First, it's a necessary response. Secondly, it can't go on forever, so there needs to be a shift from the emergency to the regeneration and the growth of the economy. And, you know, quite frankly, it needs to happen next over the course of the next year, health outcomes mm. uh, permitting. Uh, this is manageable, Jennifer, I think, at this stage, provided we emerge from this, we start to emerge from this, with a direction for the economy. Okay, so, so how long should it go on for? I mean, if you're talking about emerging, we have to know when that will start. Well, I, I think, I mean, it's part of the calendar is determined by the health outcomes, and we're in the middle of uh, another wave here in the UK, uh, which uh, has certain uh, consequences. But the longer it goes on, irrespective of the health outcomes... The more people's skills atrophy, the more uh, businesses will have a harder time coming back. And the more the shift from support for jobs moves to support for workers, if you will, Mm. and support for industries of the past moves to support for industries of the future or making way for industries of the future. Now, that's a 30,000-foot answer. But there will need to be a reorientation of this spending uh, in the not too distant well, future. Well, I, I think we may have somebody who wants to perhaps develop that, okay. that thought process. Uh, Anne Pettifor is with us, Director of Policy Research in Macroeconomics, one of the, the few people who correctly predicted the 2008 yes. crash. Anne, what did you want to say? On his point about banking being fundamentally about intermediation, connecting borrowers and savers in the real economy, surely far more important is banking as credit creation, money creation, to use the title of a Bank of England, Mm. a famous Bank of England paper of 2014. So if both central and commercial bankers can create new money, how are we to understand the rate of interest? And in particular now, how do we to understand negative rates of interest? And, And does that not imply that there's something very wrong in the system, something very wrong with the macroeconomic framework? 
something very wrong with the economy, that we're moving towards negative interest rates and perhaps something wrong between the balance between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Thank you. Isn't that a very big problem? That's a fantastic set of questions. So 3% of the money roughly in the UK economy is created by the Bank of England and the rest is created by the private sector. Um, why can the private sector not just create money without limit? Part of what disciplines that is the buffers that banks have to hold um, and that spreads and other uh, financial institutions have to hold. And what happened in the run-up to the crisis, one of the things is those buffers became very small because the assumption was that risks were very low. So part of the control on the amount of money that's created and whether the amount of money gets out of whack, if, to use a non-technical term with the economy, is the oversight of banks and the oversight of the system that the authorities have to do and the amount of trust they put in that money creation. Is the market always right or are you restricting it? My view, which is, I'm afraid, as little conventional as a central banker, but I only just left six months ago on why interest rates are so low is because of several things, big forces in the global economy, uh, demographics, technology. But very importantly, to bring it back to this lecture, is that we have gone through a series of crises and the desire for individuals and institutions to have a large amount of that money in very safe assets, that pushes the interest rates down. Now, if we had a more stable system hmm. on the financial side, to some extent on the political and geopolitical side, that's a good in and of itself, obviously, but what it does for the macro economy is it actually pushes up the overall, sorry to use economic term, equilibrium rate of interest, which moves us away from conversations about negative interest rates and other extraordinary uh, circumstances that we're in. And thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have a, a member of our virtual audience sitting at home, uh, Shorab Sachadeva. Good evening, Dr. Carney. The question I have is uh, financial prudence is something we all sort of learn from our childhood. And given what's going on with house prices, they keep sort of seem to be rising. Is it something we need to be thinking about? Can they just keep going up in this unprecedented crisis over a century we have seen? And what is fueling the sentiment? Because I'm not a financial person from background, but applying the sensible fabric of financial fiscal principles, it just doesn't make sense that people can keep borrowing and there's no end to paying it back. I like your question, in part because it's consistent with that um, piece of advice I received many years ago that if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. One of the things, of course, that has changed, and it goes back to Anne's uh, question, is that overall level of interest rates are very, very low. So people's ability or the cost of borrowing and the cost of servicing those mortgages has gone uh, down uh, considerably. And therefore, there is an adjustment upwards for house prices as a consequence of that if everything else is the same. However... It's not upwards without limit, first point. And then the second point is, ultimately, there is a relationship to the underlying economy um, and just uh, facts such as, uh, you know, the number of households in the region and the number of house homes that are built. Last point for those who aren't in the UK, one of the challenges in the UK over many years has been there's very few houses that are built relative to the size of the population. And very simply, Canada is half the size of the UK in population. It's easy to build houses there. There's lots of land. But we build as many houses in Canada as the UK does. And so there's just a basic mismatch that, that happens there. Saurav, thank you very much for your question. Let's uh, cross over now to Dame Helena Morrissey, who has uh, worked in the bond markets, yes. is a financier, what? is a writer. Many of us uh, uh, read your work. Helena, what did you want to ask? Thank you. Well, Mark, I totally agree. Um, and thank you for your emphasis that to break the cycle, we need true cultural change. And you listed in your lecture uh, a number of actions and efforts that have been made since the financial crisis to achieve this. And yet since then, and it continues to happen, that there are so many more scandals, um, the foreign exchange market rigging, gold yeah. pricing, a raft of money laundering schemes, uh, the Neil Woodford uh, debacle here. So doesn't the evidence suggest that all the talk about purpose and about ethics, even about diversity of thought, is just lip service and that greed still prevails, that financial leopards can't or won't change their spots? That cultural change does take time. I do think one of the things that has begun to happen, and really only in the last couple of years, is there have been some scandals and not just the individuals, you know, who tend to be mid-level uh, or sometimes lower level in the firm who are doing these outrages, 
but the senior most people are bearing the cost. And, and the point being, well, you didn't supervise your employee or you didn't train your employees or you have a culture in your organization that tolerates or encourages cutting corners. And that has meant, and there's a very recent one where the senior most people in um, uh, one of the large global banks saw Helena half to a, uh, two-thirds of their annual compensation taken back from them. Now, we can debate whether that was enough, but they weren't involved personally and all in it, but they had responsibility. Aren't the people who do enter this field, Helena, you get more wolves of Wall Street than you do get people who, you know, have some kind of vocational calling to this? The actual nature of what we do is going to attract people who want to make money often. I do think, though, is that we actually need yeah. to get out and explain the social purpose of finance and encourage really bright, really, you know, people who really want to do the right thing for others um, to see it as service and to see that, you know, wealth creation for people in their old age and so forth is, a, is something that adds value to society. And I do think we are making some progress, but often people just read the headlines and, and it does feel sometimes as though it's too slow. Oh, I, mean, I mean, a lot of people coming in, Sharon uh, Gladish also, I think you've both answered this, would a more diverse pool of bankers move towards a more ethical culture? I think, I mean, both of you were saying yes, God yes. Absolutely, and um, it started in, Helena uh, helped lead the 30 Club and in fact led the 30 Club and led it globally. I think the first time we met was at, uh, properly met, was at an event in uh, Washington on bringing it to America. Well, what is the 30 Club for so people who don't know what that get, is? Uh, I mean, it's, it's the first step, which is to get um, 30% of uh, boards female. Right. Um, so the first big step and, 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 you know, there's more to be done, but in terms of increasing diversity. Diversity definitely helps. It changes risk management, changes thinking. Uh, it challenges assumptions and, and clubbiness within institutions. Let's take another question. Uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Vandorfer is with us, who has worked for 20 years in financial services, c covering fintech, banking, investment. Yeah. Um, Ruth. Yeah, thank you very much. So since the crash, we had ultra-low interest rates and quantitative easing, and even more now uh, during the COVID-19 period. What is different now is that the indebtedness not only of households is significant, but those of governments and businesses. So my question is, isn't it a bit too soon to congratulate ourselves until we see that consumers, businesses, corporates, banks and governments can really cope with resetting loans in a higher rate environment with the debt burden they now have? Yes. Uh, well, I hope I didn't sound uh, Trumpless. I was, I was more about direction and the essence of these reforms and where they were moving. I do think the one area where I, I maybe have more confidence is that I think for a large financial institution that gets itself in trouble in the future, the costs are going to fall first and foremost on the senior managers, their shareholders, and that as opposed to instantly jumping to society. But to go to your the core of your point, we are in a very difficult situation. I mean, we should be absolutely clear about this. One thing that has happened unusually over the course of this year, and you know this because you look at these numbers, is that household balance sheets actually in general have not improved because on the whole, and there's people in hardship, but on the whole, people have not been able to spend as much. There's just less flexibility for the authorities now than yeah. there, there was uh, previously. But, but the, the flip side of that, and the thing that a lot of people are worried about, is it going to be austerity again? Is that what is going to make up the deficit? I mean, it's a, a decision for authorities, but I think we move from the emergency support as the health emergency, as and when the health emergency starts to come off. And if I could if just, I'm sorry to do numbers, but if I just take, let's say a deficit for one of the big economies now is 20% of GDP, which is a wartime type deficit. Roughly half of that is support to individuals like the furlough scheme in the UK and support to businesses that aren't trading just to keep them going. As the economy reopens, that money is drawn back because most of those people, not all of them, unfortunately, but most of them will go back to their jobs and many of those businesses will function. And the deficit moves down as a consequence of that. Then the question is, and this is where austerity would come, is if you try instantly to reduce that deficit. And my judgment would be that is not the right thing to do. The challenge is then to change the mix of that spending that's left by the government so that supporting investment because as Ruth is saying, governments don't have that much flexibility and companies that uh, remain viable, they've been borrowing money in general or certainly their financial situation. 
with the exception of a few tech giants, is, is much more challenging. Uh, we can now talk to Jim O'Neill, uh, who has a question. Now, Jim, just to remind you, um, some of you may know him from the House of Lords, but also uh, worked for Goldman Sachs as chief economist. Uh, Jim, what did you want to ask? Well, thank you very much, and thanks, Mark, and for all the others for the very interesting questions. Do you think that the apparent increases in the number of so-called market failures, whether it be banks trying to grow their investment banking businesses at all costs, something very close to me, the failure of uh, pharmaceutical companies to pursue antibiotic research, or indeed uh, something I think you're going to talk about again, uh, the in lack of incentives for fighting climate change. Are all of these things primarily a consequence of some broad failings of capitalism or because the way we pursue regulation is not smart enough or just too narrowly focused? It's a great question. Um, I think on the banking side, part of it was a, was, was a regulatory and oversight failure that was there, blended with some loss of a sense of the ultimate purpose of banking. I think the more interesting one is, uh, uh, let's pick up the pharma. Uh, basically, big pharma wasn't uh, investing in uh, solving diseases or drugs for diseases that primarily affected the developing world. Um, and there were various reasons for that, but basically it wasn't profitable enough. Now, it could affect a huge numbers of people. And uh, there was a combination of a philanthropic approach. Bill Gates and others put up money, the G7 put up money in a, in a system, something called the AMC, which is now being used, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but yes. for, for COVID, mm -hmm. which, is, so. which is to say, if you pharma company come up with a solution for pneumococcus was the disease, which affect huge impact in the developing world, we'll give you the profit rent for that, and then you just produce it at the, at the marginal cost. Okay. It was providing the incentive, society saying, we want to solve this problem. Mm. In this case, then backed by money. And with COVID, what we're trying to do globally and we're not there yet to the international cooperation point because we don't have the money yet for it, is to say, we want to solve COVID for the world. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to put up the money for the world in order for it to happen. I, I don't want to call it a societal failure, it's, but it's a lack of ambition or shortcoming of society. And we need to confront those issues. And we're trying to confront those on climate change. I wonder whether there, you know, there's, mm. there's, a, there's a failure of cooperation sometimes that goes on between politics and economics. So uh, I know that a, um, a politician once said to me, oh, economists, you know, uh, they have predicted five of the last three recessions. And so there is a disconnect between the politicians and the economists and the economists themselves. I've heard it many times, and maybe you have too, that politics is kind of a breed below. There is a class below economists? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> but uh, but, I, but does, this, does this at all chime in, since you've had one foot in each camp, um, uh, Jim, and I, who knows, you may well end up having a foot in each camp. I don't know what your, your future holds for you, Mark. But, but is that a, a problem, that, you know, there are two sides that don't speak the same language and perhaps are a little bit... Um, suspicious of each other. Typical economist behaviour. I'm going to uh, respond by slightly uh, answering you in a different way than you, you intend, really. But I want to refer back to one of the things Mark said at the, at the beginning and where he ended. Part, part of the problem of uh, most of my professional life is people treat economics as a, as a science. Mark described yeah. it as not physics. It, it's not physics. It is a social science of which many aspects of our are very unknown. It has to be somehow brought more into the mindsets of people that want to uh, pursue economic policies and, and that there are no definitive outcomes from one set versus another. And a, a bit more um, humility and uh, open-mindedness about potential outcomes, I think, would play a big role in, in bridging bridging the gaps between users of economics, whether they be politicians or any others. But also, importantly, for those of us in the profession that try to advocate uh, one solution versus another, to be a bit more humble about the likelihood of, of, of definitive success or not. Yeah, I think it's exceptionally well said. But the, the one other thing that comes to mind as you were talking about economists and, and politicians is, uh, now I'm going to speak like economists as well, which is there are many situations where there are, quote, multiple equilibria. Said in other ways, different things could happen. There could be different outcomes. Oh. They're equally possible. Let's say they're equally possible. And the question is, could there be an intervention, uh, to use the phrase I think of uh, one of the governments Alistair Darling was in, to make the weather, 
right? Um, that, that influences it. And the examples we were talking about a moment ago on the health side with certain drugs, you can make the weather. You can literally help make it much more likely that a certain drug will be uh, discovered. Part of that is behavioral role, right? So it's not physics. It's not like you will definitely get this drug, but you could put in place the circumstances um, that encourage it, and, uh, and then you have to have some element of trust in the market that it will figure a way to get there. That's one element of humility is for, for economists is not to have everything taped out and, and put in that, as I said earlier, a deterministic mm. formula. Uh, but there are cases, last point, where we need to have the ambition to try to make the weather or to make people healthier. Yeah, well, I know we're going to come back to that uh, yeah. in, in a future uh, lecture. Jim O'Neill, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's take one more question uh, from the audience. Well, this is, this is good. Caroline Wiggin has asked, how can confidence in experts be restored? It's not a good sign when at the end of your lecture and after all the Q&A, the <laughs> question all, is asked whether <laughs> confidence in experts could be restored. <laughs> so, Caroline, I think uh, I'm the wrong one to answer that. Uh, there's a variety of factors. I mean, it does start with some element of transparency, but it's not all transparency. It's uh, ultimately you want some trust in experts, and if you need total transparency, you don't have that trust. Some element of communication, so translating from complex to understandable, uh, not making things overly complex. It requires an element of humility, so admitting when you got something wrong and then explaining why it was wrong, incredibly important in this moment uh, of the health crisis or with, when new information comes in and, uh, and adjusts. And it requires, the other thing it requires, quite frankly, it requires competence. I mean, you're going to trust experts if they get it right more often than they get it wrong. Mm. Um, and you shouldn't trust them if they continually get it wrong. I suppose it wouldn't hurt if a politician said you could listen to experts and that was fine. I couldn't possibly comment. Shame. Uh, that is unfortunately uh, all that we have time for, but we've touched on so many things that we are going to return to next time in his third lecture of this series. Mark looks at the COVID crisis and interrogates our ideas of value further still. Just how do states calculate the value of a human life and why does that value vary so much in different countries? It really raises some uh, fascinating, often deeply uncomfortable and challenging questions. But for now, my thanks to all of you for listening, for your questions, and especially to our wreath lecturer, Mark Carney. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. In my next lecture... I'll be looking at how the COVID crisis has made us reconsider how we value health, wealth, and opportunity. And you might be interested to know that the BBC Wreath Lectures by Hilary Mantel, Stephen Hawking, Margaret Macmillan, and many, many others are all available to download from BBC Sounds.